some of us are in a tough season or we had a tough day this week or life is hard and some of us are at the other end and there's joy and excitement. And we're all over the place. But it doesn't change that you are recklessly running out for each of us. Our, our circumstances might not change when we walk out of here today, but I pray that you do a mighty work in each of us. I pray that our perspective and, and our life and our, our, our a glimpse of how much you love us just covers us and washes us and changes us as we go through the rest of our day and our week to come. God, get me out of the way. I want to hear you. Let us hear your voice this morning. I pray. Amen. So we've been talking for a few weeks about our calling. And, not, and like your calling. Like what is it that God has for you in your life? And what does he have for me? And pastors read a couple times from Jeremiah 29, kind of basing this series on that, and we're going to read that again this morning, but I'm going to read it in Eugene Patterson's The Message, which is sort of a paraphrase. This is God's word on the subject. As soon as Babylon 70 years are up and not a day before, I'll show up and I'll take care of you as I promised and bring you back home. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned. Plans to take care of you, not to abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. When you call on me, when you come and you pray to me, I will listen. When you come looking for me, you'll find me. When you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I'll make sure that you won't be disappointed. <laughs> Is that an amazing promise? Like we have to get serious about pursuing him and wanting him more than anything else, and he is going to make sure that we are not disappointed. But you know what happens? Life gets hard. We want the easy street to the destination. Right? We, want, we want quick results. We want quick answers. We want things to come fast. We want things to come not hard. We want things to, we want to jump to the six-figure salary, the house, the relationship, the street, the friends. Like, we want all of that, but we don't want to work to get to that. Northwestern Mutual Insurance Company did a study that said 70% of Americans aged teenagers on up are unable to stick to long-term goals. Because we live in such a culture that is so fast. The, the internet, the news, the spreading of social media, the Instapots, <laughs> DoorDash, social media. Convenience is how we live. And so we don't want the struggle. We don't want the effort to get where God is leading. We just want to get there. We want the destination, but not the journey. We sing about God's reckless love for us that he's going to light up shadows and he's going to climb mountains and he's just chasing after us. And we're like, cool, uh, I want that destination. Like, we don't want to pursue. We just want to be pursued. We want the destination. We don't want 
the journey. So we're going to look at Paul's life a little bit today um, because I think there are pieces of his life that will speak to us about this. You remember the story of Paul's conversion? Like Paul was like persecuting Christians. The more Christians he could throw in jail, the happier he was. In fact, he went to one of the emperors and requested, do I have permission to go to all these places? Would you write a letter for me that gives me permission to go into all these different towns and bring back to Jerusalem men and women in chains because they are pursuing the way that is Jesus? And he got the letter. And he's on the road to Damascus, and you know God strikes him down, and, and, and he's blinded, and he's carried into Damascus, and he's blind for three days, and then Ananias comes, and he prays for him, and the scales drop from his eyes, and Scripture says immediately, immediately he starts to preach about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. His life, he was 30 years old. His life was about persecuting these Christians and three days. Oh. When you think you don't have it right, when you think you can't do the thing, you probably can't, but God can. In three days, he changed the way this man had walked and believed for 30 years. God has a plan. The scripture is, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I, you won't be disappointed. So what do we do? We sit back. <laughs> We're like, okay, God, I'll just wait. And I don't think that's the way. In fact, I'm sure there's nothing about that that he wants us to sit back. So Paul stays in Damascus and he travels back and forth from Damascus to Jerusalem for eight years. And historians tell us that he's praying and he's meeting with leaders and he's meeting with rabbis and he's learning and he's fasting and he's praying and he's surrounding himself by holy people and he's learning more and more and more about this Jesus that he's preaching about. And in Acts 13, so eight years, ten years, somewhere in there, after the Damascus blinding by God. In Acts chapter 13, we read this. So if you have your Bible, open it up. And if you phone, whatever you use, and if you don't have a phone with the Bible on it or a Bible, I suggest you bring it to church. Because you know what? Then you can write notes in it. Because this afternoon, you're going to be like, what did Gabrielle preach on? You're like, I don't remember. <laughs> Maybe God has a word for you this morning, so you need to write some notes. So in Acts 13, chapter, uh, verses 1 through 3, among the prophets and teachers of the church of Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Manaean, the ch childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, and the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. Paul begins what we learn are three missionary journeys. The first one lasted a year. He goes out and he preaches about Jesus and he plants a couple churches. And the second missionary journey is about two to three years. He goes further and he goes longer and he plants more churches and he does more preaching. And do you know what happened to Paul during those first two missionary journeys? He got dragged out of town. He got stoned. 
He got put in jail. He got chained to the walls in jail. He had to go to court. He was slandered. He was arrested. He was beaten. He spent four years on these first two missionary journeys, and everything that you can imagine could have happened to him happens to him. But he keeps going. <laughs> he keeps going. I'd have been like, see you, God. <laughs> like, this is way too hard. Like, he had this life where he was, like, arresting all these people, and he had the, like, the emperor's ear and all of the things, and now he found Jesus, and he's suffering, and he's being thrown into jail, and he's being slandered, and everything bad that can be happening to him, and he keeps on going. Do you ever wonder if Paul sometimes at night lying in bed was like, serious, God? A, a little bit of help here? Have you done that? I have. Serious? Come on, God. Like, there's got to be a light at the end of this tunnel. And in Acts 9, 18, we read this. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent, for I am with you. Does that sound familiar to Jeremiah? No one will attack and harm you. Many people in the city belong to me. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half teaching the word of God. God says to him, don't give up, and I want you to keep speaking. I want you to not be silent. I want you to keep going. And so he goes on his third missionary journey, and this is the longest one. This is the one that lasts six years, eight years. Paul's already traveled for three. He's experienced all these horrible things. He has his vision from God. He gets out of the boat and he lands in Ephesus. And do you know where he goes? Do you know his first stop? Acts 19, verse 8, he says, Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and he took the believers with him then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles when handkerchiefs or aprons that had barely touched his skin were placed on sick people they were healed of their diseases, and evil spirits were expelled. Paul left the church. <laughs> he walked out. For three months, he's preaching about the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and at first, everyone's all excited. It's great, and then they start grumbling. They disagree with him. It was too hot. It was too cold. They didn't like the way he stood. They didn't like the message. They didn't like to be challenged. Who knows what it was? But we can't relate to that at all, can we? <laughs> I've been in a church or two. I meet people all the time who say, I I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. And you know what they mean? They've been hurt by the church. They've been hurt by the people in the church because the people are the church. And they hurt them. And if I'm here and I'm supposed to be expressing and sharing the love of Jesus and I'm a Jesus follower and then he, that tells me I'm supposed to talk about him and, and live the way that he wants me to live and I hurt people, then I'm doing it wrong. And they're walking out of the church and saying, I ain't going back. Paul says, who's coming with me? Come on. Who's coming? We're out of here. We're going. And Luke tells us that the believers 
follow him. And he goes to the lecture hall of Tyrannus. He goes to the public arena that is in Ephesus, where Greeks and Romans are there, and they're, they're um, debating philosophy, and there's all sorts of different religions being preached and expounded on. And for two years, Paul is allowed to stay in that public lecture place and tell people about Jesus. And that's where he goes. Hmm. It, it's kind of like going to the local coffee shop. Or maybe I'm just going to go downtown to the rescue mission and hang out in the cafeteria with people who have needs and I can tell them about Jesus. Maybe I'm going to city life and I'm going to love on kids who need to be loved on. Maybe I'm going to go to the Y, where people come in with all of their stuff, and they're willing to talk about anything. And those are the places that Paul's like, church, I'm out. <laughs> I'm going to go where people need and people are willing and want to hear about Jesus Christ. This is Paul's last hurrah, this third missionary journey. In fact, he is arrested at the end of this, and he is, um, goes to trial, and he's sentenced to die. He encountered Jesus, and he had really hard life being challenged by people and being physically and emotionally torn apart. The story doesn't end with Paul on earth going, I conquered. The, the story ends with him being condemned to die because they didn't like what he was doing. But he never stopped. Paul didn't give up. He kept going. He kept pursuing Jesus because he knew the promise that I will recklessly pursue you. He didn't give up. He didn't go, this is hard, I'm out. He didn't run away. He didn't jump to whatever glory job that he could have found. He pursued the way that he knew God had asked him to do. And do you know about Paul's life? He wrote 14 of the 27 New Testament books. That's more than half. Paul traveled 15,000 miles. 10,000 of those were on foot to tell people about Jesus. He planted 14 churches. He talked about grace and sanctif sanctification and the good news of Jesus. That was his message. Quite literally, you and I are sitting in this room today because of the work that Paul did in the name of Christ 2,000 years later. Wow. And I'm like, mm, today I kind of hard got, I, I, I don't really want to go that way. It makes you think, doesn't it? He was probably, he was 30 when he had the conversion. He died when he was about 50 or 60. So for 30 years, he stayed with the plan. And Paul knew that God was the hero in his story, not Paul. And Paul knew that every single place he went, God went before him. God prepared the way. There is nothing that Paul experienced that God had not already been there in. Do you know that about your life? Do you know this week and last week and the coming weeks when you are in hard times like like, he's already been there. He knows the end of the story. Yeah. There is nothing you can do to change God's future, plan, hope for you. Oh, Pastor Gabrielle, you don't know. I did that. Yeah, I know. You don't know my background. Yes, I do. You don't know what happened. Yep, I can imagine. And you cannot thwart 
the plan that Jesus Christ has for your life. So this week, I started to think about, I started, it caused me to kind of reflect on my life. And I want to tell you a little bit of story about my life. I was born in New York City, lived there for a few years, moved to New Jersey, lived in that area growing up, and I grew up in a very, very Catholic home. Any Catholics in here, former Catholics? You guys are like, oh, I can't admit it. <laughs> okay, you can. It's a great thing. My foundation in Jesus was born out of the Catholic Church. My parents loved people in a really unique way. They really cared for people. They didn't talk about it, but they did it. And here's an example of how my parents did that. We would have holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, like everything, and there would always be people there that we didn't know. There'd be family members and neighbors, but then there was always the unknown people. It was the nurse who worked at the doctor's office where my dad was who didn't have family. It was a guy whose wife who had left him, and so he was alone without the kids on this holiday. It was the guy who sold the bagels in this subway station in New York City that my dad had befriended. Like, there were always these people, and I remember later on coming home from college that I would know that there would be strangers in our house, strangers who became family and friends were loved because they didn't have a chance. My parents taught me that. So I went to Catholic school. I went to Catholic um, elementary school. I went to Catholic high school. And I went to a Catholic university. We were Catholic. And, um, <laughs> and in high school, before you went to lunch, we had to go to mass every day. And oddly, like weirdly, like I loved it. But it started to spawn some questions in me. I started to ask questions. And then it was a time when they had a really, I don't know how else to say this, just this mean order of nuns that were assigned to our school. They were mean. I have some scars to prove it. And it might have to do with me more than just that. But they were mean. And I started to ask questions, like, why can't I read the Bible? Why does the priest have to read the Bible to me? Like, we were given a Bible for class. At the end of class, we had to turn it back. We were not to keep it. Why do I have to go to a priest for confession? Like, I, I just was asking, I wanted to know, and dear God, why was I taught the theology of marriage by a nun? <laughs> True story. <laughs> True story. <laughs> I think I was healed from that. Um, then um, I went to... It was time to apply for college. And throughout my high school years, I had my dream college was Duke University. Like, that's where I wanted to go. My parents, earlier in their marriage, had lived in Boston. My parents loved Boston. They're like, go to school in Boston. I was like, yeah, I don't really want to go to Duke. And they're like, go to Boston. And so my parents would take me to Boston. I'd be like, it's OK. I'm not crazy about it. I really want to go to Duke. It's funny how God works. I got waitlisted at Duke, and I never got in. So guess where I went? <laughs> Boston. I was one of those kids who didn't know what they wanted to be when they grew up. So I was like a regular in the registrar's office changing my major. Let's try computers this week. Let's try science. Let's try history. I remember I signed up to be a history major, and I got like a 46 on my first exam. I'm like, that's not it. <laughs> not doing that. <laughs> And so I landed on communication, and I became an intern for the communication department in public speaking. Hmm. At Boston College, I met a priest by the name of Father Bob Brownruther, who to this day is most Jesus, one of the most Jesus-loving people I've ever met in my life. And he took 12 of us to Haiti for a month. And we worked with Mother Teresa's home for the destitute and dying. And it was there that I held women as they died and children as they starved. And I held families as they laid their loved ones to rest. And it was life-changing. 
And being with Bob was, and my friends was life changing. I finished grad school and I get a teaching job in Muncie, Indiana. I had never heard of it. <laughs> like when you grow up on the East Coast, you don't know that Indiana, it's just not a thing, <laughs> which is really bad. <laughs> I was like, Indiana, Ball State, sure. I'll go out there for a year and see the cornfields and then I'll come home. <laughs> and the very first day that I was teaching at Ball State, unknown to me, I had a student in my class, his name was Mike. After class, he went back to the dorm room. He called his friend who was in Fort Wayne, whose name happened to be Park, and said, I just met your wife. Wow. Wow. Three years later, we were married. <laughs> we lived in Huntertown, we have four kids. So I get a job at the local church because it's easy and I can bring the kids and it's just right down the road. And there were like custodians, everybody, there was like 15 of us on staff and then 2009 happens when the economy crashes. <laughs> and so they got rid of everybody except the lead pastor, the part-time office person and me. So I started to do other things preach, go into the hospital and visit. I knew what that was like. Officiating weddings and funerals. So I did that for a long time. And I remember there was this day that Park and I and the kids were driving uh, out east to see my family. I remember where we were. We were in US 30, and I can, I can tell you the spot we were. I had this question for Park. And I was afraid to ask him, which is dumb. So I was like, mm -hmm, so OK, the kids are quiet. And I said, hey, I got a question. He's like, shoot. And I said, what do you think if I go to seminary and become a pastor? <laughs> do you want to know what he said? This is great. He didn't say, we got four kids in high school and going into college. We don't have the money. He's like, we don't have the time. He could have said anything. Do you know what he said? What took you so long? <laughs> there is a guy who saw Jesus at work in me in ways that I was unsure of. Somebody's going to speak some truth into your life. So I become a pastor and doing the pastoring thing, and I fall in love with the Y. I land at Jackson R. Lehman YMCA, and Tabitha Irvin, who's the executive director there. Ha! Huh. Where do you go to church? I go to New Covenant. Very cool. And I met Luther years and years ago once. And then I meet Zeke, and I become really good friends with Zeke, and our church starts to do some things with you guys. And have you ever wondered how you in this church landed a old, white, female pastor? <laughs> Come on, you have wondered, because I have wondered. <laughs> I know it. You can admit it. It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> and you go back to your life and you're like, that's how it happened. That's how you're stuck with me. You can't do anything about it because Jesus' plan is better than anything that you might want. <laughs> I was thinking last week, if you've been with us for the past couple of weeks, Pastor shared the story of when he became a Christian and he just wanted to spend all of his time in the church because he was afraid. Like, I don't want to fall back. I don't want to make mistakes. I don't want to return. So he's like, any time that church was open, he was there. And do you remember this? Like, I can't get the image out of my head. He joined a knitting group. <laughs> he sat here in church and he's like, knit one pearl too. I was super impressed that you knew that. And I was like, that is the strange, I cannot get the image. Like, do you see him with knitting needles in his eyes? I, I just can't. <laughs> but you know what I'm thankful for? That that group was there for him. That I envision it was a group of mostly older women who had a lot of wisdom and some time. And they probably taught him the knit one pearl too, but they didn't, but they taught him other things. And they loved on him, and they made you safe. 
and he is our pastor today because of something that happened in that knitting group. And you go, what good is a knitting group? Oh my gosh, it changed his life, it changed our lives, right? Young people, I want to share something with you today. You can decide if you fall into that category or not. <laughs> when people my age got jobs and careers, we stuck with it forever. That's what you do, right? You're the teacher, you're the thing, whatever. Like, you just stick with it. That is your job. You don't do anything else. In fact, when I was at the first church and we would like hire people and I'd get resumes and people had like one year or two year stints on resumes, like three was a long one, that like totally red flagged the resume because you're like, they can't hold the job down, right? But you know what today, young people, your resumes are all one year, two years, one year, two years. Like that's what they look like. And that's not a bad thing. I've said numerous times, I think you all are going to live longer than my generation because you're enjoying life. But here's the thing. If your resume looks like that because you are pursuing fun, only the things that you want, things that would be cool, then I think there's a problem. See, our job is to share Jesus Christ with people. And the only way I could do that is by pursuing what it is he has for me. And it might be in one year and two years since. That in itself isn't wrong. It's the motivation that you have to look at your life and go, is this me or is this God? Now, I promise you, you'll make mistakes. And yet, God's plan can't be changed. So you have to have some grace for yourself. There are going to be mistakes. Just keep going after God, because he's running recklessly after you. Do, do you remember the story in John? Jesus is walking down the road. He's got some disciples with him, and they're talking, and there's a blind man. And they go, hey, Jesus, why is he blind? Like, what did he do? Or what did his parents do? And Jesus said, they didn't do anything. He's blind so that the power of God can be seen in him for other people. That's what you get to do. Have you, if you haven't, you should go home and get on YouTube and look at these. There are videos um, of uh, um, garbage collectors who come into neighborhoods and kids have fallen in love with these men and women. And they jump off the truck and they hug the kids and the kids are giving them cookies and presents and the garbage collectors pick them up and they let the, the kid throw some garbage in the truck and there's like relationship there. That is people who are not like just doing the job. Like this is where God has me today and I'm going to be all in and I'm going to do it. Last night, uh, he has no idea what I was preaching about tonight. Parks starts laughing, and what are you laughing at? He's like, I'm watching this video. These two little boys are sitting on the curb of the road, and they've got little dump trucks. And across the street, there's construction. And one of those, like, diggers, like, is taking up dirt and pouring it into the little boys' trucks. They don't need to take time to do that. But they're like, hey, I'm just going to love people where I am because that's what I'm supposed to do because Jesus tells me to do that. I'm going to be the best at the thing that I am at, at the moment, right? Yep. Pastor David and I were talking this morning, and I said, hey, it looks like a break in the weather. You're not going to be out in the miserable cold. And he's like, yeah, I mostly do okay. And I was like, come on, do you, like, do you hate it? And he's like, no, well, there's a couple times that it's hard, but I just keep going. And I started to think about this woman who delivers our mail. And when Park got sick, we had, um, the doctors recommended that he drink protein drinks. So I'd get them by like a couple of cases at a time, wherever I can get them cheap, Walmart, Amazon, wherever. And, um, um, and for a while, instead of being delivered by Amazon or Walmart or whomever, it was, went through the U.S. Post Office. And so this woman in her car has to drive up our driveway 
And one day I encountered her, she's getting out and she's putting the drinks on. She said, you must really like these. Kind of with a little bit of a tone. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. I said, hey, did you know Park is sick? And she's like, no, I didn't. Oh my gosh. Was, uh. And so she had, like, there was another month after that, or a couple months that she kept delivering these. And, I would come home and they would be on this bench outside of her garage with a big smiley face or a note that said, I'm praying for you, thinking about Bark. <sighs> so you need you to be, God needs you to be good where you are. He's got the next thing and he's going to let you know when it is and he's going to let you know how it is. He's going to do all of that. But right now, today, he has you at this space and how, you, how are you doing? Are you calling are you him? Are you wanting to know him? Are you like diving in knowing him? Because he says, you won't be disappointed. Gosh, there are days I'm disappointed. I'm like, stop being, that's ridiculous. That's what he wants for you and from you. I want to go back to that. Jeremiah verse. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. When you call on me, when you come and you pray to me, I'll listen. When you come looking for me, you will find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I will make sure you're not disappointed. <laughs> He's recklessly pursuing us and he wants us dare I say, to recklessly pursue him and what he has for our life. You know what Paul wrote in Romans? He wrote, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, of those who are called according to his purpose. This is the guy who basically suffered <laughs> a lot from the day he encountered Jesus for years and years and years and was killed for it. And he said, all things work for good. He didn't say, I had a good month there, that like February was a good month. He says, all things, the hard, the ugly, the easy, the things you don't understand, all of those work for good as we pursue God. When you want it more than anything else, I will make sure you will not be disappointed. Can we pray for you today? What do you need? Do you feel abandoned by God and you forgot that he's with you and that he's gone before you? Or, or maybe you're one of those people who are jumping to the destination and, and not living in the journey. Maybe you're one of those people who forgot that he is recklessly pursuing you. Maybe you, this week, can do what I did and look back at your life. And you'll see him and you'll hear him. When Pastor prayed this morning, he said, we're a family. We do all of this together. So I want to invite you up here to pray. And pastors, if you're around, come and pray for whoever comes up and, and whoever else wants to pray. Like, we don't go through anything alone. If you're hurting, we, we are with you. We are with each other. If you're wondering, we're willing to have a cup of coffee with you and talk it out. If you're grieving and you just need somebody to sit with you, there are many people in this place who would come do that for you. A week ago, two weeks, I don't even remember what the date is, we went out east for my sister's funeral. And I can't tell you the number of texts and hugs and cards and things I received from this church family. You know, the one who you never thought would be here. And you all have loved on us. We get to love on each other and do that. 
if you want to be prayed for, come on up. We will pray, and then we will pray our way out. Come up if you desire to be prayed for this morning. If there's a place that you just need encouraged, a place that you need to hear from Jesus. Wondering, doubting, come on up. Hurting, come on up. Searching, come up. This makes you strong. This doesn't make you weak. Taking this step is strong. And the one who recklessly pursues you already knew that you were going to be here this morning and that he was going to tug on your heart. He's after you. He's calling. He wants you.
God, I feel a little bit like Pastor Luther. I don't want to leave. Because this is safe and this is good. And a lot of us are walking out of here today with some hurts. But you're going with us and you will recklessly pursue us this week. God, for each person in this room, I don't know what it is that they need, if they need wisdom or determination or rest or hope. They need to feel your loving arms around them. Would you do that for them this week? And we will sing your praises. We will worship you for recklessly pursuing us and for giving us the strength to stay committed to the call. Thank you for being a God who loves us and sees us and knows us for all of time. For God who knows the end of the story, even when we don't, you say, trust me, and so we are going to do that. We love you. We thank you for this community, for this church family. We thank you for the love that you give us. We pray this in your name. Good week, everybody. Go in God's peace. Love you.